Good evening. This is Emily Summerfield for Abolition News Network. It's March 1st, 1874. And today, for our dedicated Angel Award, we took a recommendation for the Secretary of the Vigilance Committee of Philadelphia. Our, uh, our recipient of the award this evening is a rare poet, lecturer, and abolitionist who felt the need to help her people after the Civil War. Please welcome to the program, Frances Harper. So nice to meet you. you. So, Miss um, Harper, uh, since you were born in Baltimore in 1825, a free woman, what influenced you to help the cause? Miss Summerfield, I was in Little York, Pennsylvania, teaching kids in 1853 when Maryland passed a terrible law keeping free blacks from the north from entering the state under penalty of being imprisoned and sold into slavery. By mistake, a free man violated this horrible law and was sold down to Georgia. He escaped by hiding in the wheelhouse of a boat, but was caught and sent back. He died later of multiple sufferings, I heard. Because of this outrage, I pledge myself to the anti-slavery cause. That is a very terrible law. Um, why don't you tell us about your first lecture? My maiden lecture was in New Bedford, Massachusetts in 1854. I had been invited to talk at a public meeting on the subject of education and the elevation of the colored race. Since it was a huge success, I was invited to be an agent of the State of Maine Anti-Slavery Society. That's fabulous. So why don't you tell us about your career as a poet? Well, I was raised by my aunt after my mother died and educated at my uncle's school. When I was 18, I wrote Forest Leaves. That got into the newspapers. Also, that's when I wrote about Christianity. I said, Christianity is a system claiming God for its author and the welfare of man for its object. Later, I spoke in Columbus, Ohio, after the Emancipation Proclamation of 1863, questioning why God does not give us full and quick victory. I referred to slavery as the deadly gangrene that had such deep and fatal hold upon the nation. But I also said, do not despair. Well, definitely spoken from an artist's point of view. So now that the Civil War is over, what's left for you now? Well, since the war, I traveled through most of the South, seeing poverty and devastation, like in Eufaula, Alabama. I visited the plantations where people were still living in the old slavery cabins without a pane of glass, if they had any windows at all. I talked to audiences on plantations in churches, courthouses, schools, etc. My favorite state was South Carolina. I see it as a theater for the colored man's development and progress. There is brain power there. Instead of the lash, I saw school books, and over the effects of the ruins of slavery, free speech was springing up. That's great to hear. So, um, can you tell us, how were your speeches received? I have an excerpt I saved from the Mobile Alabama Register of 1871. Let me see. The mobile editor said my thoughts flowed with poetic expression. Someone said they wished they had my education, then it goes on. The speaker left the impression that she was not only intelligent and educated, she was enlightened. The main theme to her discourse was the grand opportunity that the emancipation had afforded to her race. She said to the black audience, you have muscle power and brain power. You must utilize them or be content to remain forever the inferior race. She said, get land since landless people depend on landed people. A few acres to till food and a roof over your head are the castle of your independence. That's a very glowing uh, recommendation there for you. 
So uh, why don't you tell our audience what you're trying to instill? I'd say I am laboring for equality before the law, education, and a higher manhood, especially for the freedmen. Thank you, Francis Harper. I hope that the um, young, rising generation will take encouragement from you and see you as an example. Uh, Ms. Flum, the award. Before I give you the statue, I'd love to hear one of your famous poems. Oh, that's a great idea. Delighted. Here is one of my favorites. This is called, Bury Me in a Free Land. You may make my grave wherever you will, in a lowly vale or a lofty hill. You may make it among earth's humblest graves, but not in a land where men are slaves. I could not sleep if around my grave I heard the steps of a trembling slave. His shadow above my silent tomb would make it a place of fearful gloom. I could not rest if I heard the lash drinking her blood at each fearful gash. And I saw her babes torn from her breast like trembling babes from their parent nest. I could not rest if I heard the tread of a coffle gang to the shambles led. And the mother's shriek of wild despair rise like a curse on the trembling air. I'd shudder and start if I heard the bay of the bloodhounds seizing their human prey. If I heard the captive plead in vain as they tightened afresh his calling chain. If I saw young girls from their mother's arms bartered and sold for their youthful charms, my eye would flash with a mournful flame, my death pale cheek grow red with shame. I would sleep, dear friends, where bloated might can rob no man of his dearest right. My rest shall be calm in any grave where no man calls his brother a slave. I ask no monument proud and high to arrest the gaze of passers-by. All that my spirit yearning craves is, bury me not in the land of slaves. That's beautiful. Thank you so much, Frances Harper. And for our audience, Frances Harper has been a public servant for 17 years, made thousands of lectures, and sold 50,000 books.